All right, so we're going to talk about dermatology and skin pathology in dermatology. So let's start with basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common and least lethal form of all cancers. most common but least lethal. It is a malignant epithelial cell tumor that begins as a papule, which is a small circumcised or solid elevation of the skin, and enlarges peripherally, developing into a crater that erodes. So you get crust and bleedings, etc. It presents as a flesh colored, which is cream to pink, round or oval translucent nodule with overlying small blood vessels and a hairily appearing rolled border. In 90% of all cases with the basal cell carcinoma, the lesion is seen between the hairline and the upper lip. Metastasis is very rare, um, but local invasion destroys underlying and adjacent tissue. Basal cell tumors have palisading nuclei. Basal cell carcinomas develop in the basal cell layer of the skin. Sunlight exposure leads to the formation of thymidine dimers, which damages DNA, and that's what leads to basal cell carcinoma. So what is the treatment for basal cell carcinoma? It's Mohs surgery. It's spelled M-O-H-S surgery. Mohs surgery or Mohs micrographic surgery. It's an outpatient procedure in which the tumor is surgically excised and then immediately examined under the microscope. The base and edges of the microscopically examined to verify the sufficient margins between the surgical repair of the site. If the margins are insufficient, more is removed from the patient until the margins are sufficient. So that's basal cell carcinoma in a nutshell for you. So let's talk about blistering disorders. We have a few of them. Bolus pemphigoid is one. Pemphigus vulgaris, Dermatis, uh, Dermatitis hepatiformis, Erythema multiforming. And Stevens Johnson syndrome. So let's talk about each one of these blistering syndromes. So let's start with bolus, bolus pemphigoid. Bolus pemphigoid is an autoimmune blistering disorder. So as IgG autoantibodies react against the bolus pemphigus antigens 1 and 2 in the type, um, type 17 collagen components of hemidesmosomes that typically present in elderly patients and pruritic uticarial plaques and tents and difficult to rupture bullae on the trunk of the proximal extremities. Um, the oral mucosa is usually spared. Now the histologically, histo, histology a bolus pemphigoid, you'll see serum epidermal blistering with numerous eosinophils within the blisters. Now, there's four major differences with bolus pemphigoid versus pemphigus vulgaris. Bolus pemphigoid, the lesions are pruritic versus pemphigus vulgaris, the lesions are painful and not pruritic. Number two, Bolus pemphigoid, oral mucosa lesions are rare versus pemphigus vulgaris, oral mucosa lesions are common. Um, in bolus pemphigoid, IgG autoantibodies react against bolus pemphigus antigens 1 and 2 in type 17 collagen components of the hemidesmosomes versus pemphigus vulgaris, 
IgG autoantibodies react against desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3 in not the hemidesmosomes, but the desmosomes. So in number four, linear immunofluorescent patterns of IgG and C3 along the basement membrane at the dermal epidermal junction versus in pemphigus vulgaris, you see a reticular or fishnet immunofluorescent pattern of IgG outlining the surface of epidermal keratinocytes. So now, since we've talked already about it a little bit, let's talk about pemphigus vulgaris. This is an autoimmune disease of the skin and mucosal membranes. It's IgG autoantibodies react against desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3 in desmosomes that may be triggered by medications such as penicillamine. Um, so you'll get blisters, bole, rare sores that can be potentially fatal. On immunofluorescence, you see a reticular or fishnet immunofluorescent pattern of IgG outlining the surface of keratinocytes throughout the epidermis like we've talked about. And the pathophysiology is that Ig autoantibodies react against desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3. And that is pretty much bolus pemphigus vulgaris for you. So let's talk about dermatis hepatiformis. Dermatitis hepatiformis, I'm sorry. This is an autoimmune blistering disorder associated with gluten sensitive enteropathy or celiac disease. It's caused by a deposition of IgA, not IgG, in the papillary dermis, which triggers an immune cascade resulting in neutrophil recruitment. It usually presents with flesh colored to erythemous uh, papules and, or plaques with hepatiform, which is small and clustered, um, vesicles that are symmetrically distributed over extensor surfaces, including the elbows, knees, and buttocks and shoulders. And that is dermatis hepatiformis. So what about erythema multiforme? Erythema multiforme is a skin condition of unknown etiology that usually follows infection or drug exposure. Infection or drug exposure. Um, it's possibly mediated by immune complex deposition. This is mostly IgM. So you see how you need to know all these different antibodies that are playing roles in these things. In the superficial microvasculature of the skin and oral mucosa membranes. It usually presents with mild, itchy, pink, red blotches, symmetrically arranged, and starting on the extremities. You get a classic target lesion. They're pink red. Uh, um, they're pink red ring around a pale center. The resolution usually occurs within seven to ten days. So that brings us to Stevens Johnson syndrome. This is a life-threatening condition so Stevens Johnson syndrome is a life-threatening condition affecting the skin in which cell death causes the epidermis to separate from the dermis Um, SGS is thought to be a hypersensitivity complex affecting the skin and the mucosal 
membranes. Although the majority of cases are idiopathic, the main cause or the main class of known causes is medications. Um, followed by infections and rarely cancers. Um, the medications commonly associated with Steven Johnson syndrome include NSAIDs, allopurinol, phenytoin, carbamazepine, Barbs or barbiturates and anticonvulsants. And also sulfur antibiotics. That is Stevens Johnson syndrome for you in a nutshell. And then let's talk about toxic epidermal necrolysis, also known as Lil syndrome. This is a keratinocyte necrosis with detachment of the epidermis from the dermis. Keratinocyte necrosis with detachment of the epidermis from the dermis. You get a widespread blistering and usually involving the mucosal membranes. This life-threatening condition, just like Stevens Johnson syndrome, is frequently induced by adverse reactions to medication. Toxic epidermal necrolysis is considered more severe than Stevens Johnson syndrome. So that is your blistering disorders in a nutshell for you. So let's talk about some common skin disorders. And I'll list these out for you. The first one is warts, also known as varica vulgaris. Nevocellular nevus. That's junctional nevus, or also known as a mole. These are warts. Um, uticaria or urticaria that's known as hives freckles is epilis epilis eczema is atopic dermatitis Um, allergic contact dermatitis. Psoriasis. And then you get basal cell papilloma, which is Seborrheic keratosis. Now I'm going to talk about each one of these in a little more detail, but that's just your common skin disorders. So you got warts, which is varica vulgaris. You got uh, junctional nevus, which is a mole which is nevocellular nevus, urticaria is hives, freckles is a phellus, um, atopic dermatitis is eczema, and then you have allergic contact dermatitis, psoriasis, and seborrheic keratosis, which is a basal cell papilloma. So let's talk about these. 
Vargas vulgaris or warts. This is generally a small, rough tumor, typically on the hands and feet. Um, but often other locations that can resemble, resemble a cauliflower or a solid blister. Plantar warts grow on pressure points on the soles of the feet. Warts are common and are caused by a viral infection, specifically the human papillomavirus or HPV, and are contagious when in contact with the skin of an infected person. It is also possible to get warts from using towels or other objects. They typically disappear after a few months but can last for years and recur. Condyloma acuminata on genitals is caused by HPV. So what about nevocellular nevus or the mole? Let's talk about him. These lesions are commonly named birthmarks or, and moles. By definition, nevi are benign. If, if there is a greater than 100 dysplastic nevi on the body, this can be a sign of dysplastic. This is important. Nevis syndrome. That's high yield. If there is greater than 100 dysplastic nevi on the body, this can be a sign of dysplastic nevis syndrome. Since dysplastic nevi are precursors for melanoma, increased screening is highly, highly necessary. So that's why you need to screen for moles. So let's talk about um, the hives and urticaria. This is a skin condition caused by tiny amounts of fluid that leak from blood vessels just under the skin surface. Mast cell degranulate, degranulation causes intensely pruritic wheels. It is also common for hives to be caused by allergic reactions that result in raised red skin wheels. So let's talk about freckles, good old freckles. These are clusters of concentrated melanin which are most often visible on people with a fair complexion. And that's, that's basically freckles for you. So what about atopic dermatitis? Atopic dermatitis or eczema is a disease characterized by chronic inflammation of the skin. Which is a topic hereditary and non-contagious. This is a type one hypersensitivity reaction. That is high yield. What do most people think when they think of type 1? They think of anaphylaxis, but eczema is actually a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. The skin on the flexural surfaces of the joints, for example, the inner sides of the elbows and knees, are the most commonly affected regions in people. So what about ACD, allergic contact dermatitis? This arises as a result of two essential stages, an induction phase, which primes and sensitizes the immune system for an allergic response, and an elicitation phase, in which the response is triggered. Therefore, ACD is termed a type 4 hypersensitivity or a delayed hypersensitivity reaction involving a cell-mediated allergic response. Um, 
lesions occur at the site of contact. So what about psoriasis? What do we know about that? Psoriasis is a non-contagious disorder which affects the skin and joints, psoriatic arthritis. So it affects the skin and the joints. It commonly causes red scaly patches to appear on the skin. The scaly patches caused by psoriasis, called psoriatic plaques, uh, are areas of inflammation and excess skin production. That's important. Areas of inflammation and excess skin production. Skin rapidly accumulates at these sites and takes on a silvery white appearance. Plaques frequently occur on the skin of the elbows and knees, but can affect any area, including the scalp and genitals. In contrast to eczema, which is usually found on the flexural surfaces of joints, psoriasis is more likely to be found on the extensor aspect of the joint. Um, there is an increase in stratum spinosum and a decrease in stratum gran granulosum. To diagnose this, when the plaques are scraped, one can see pinpoint bleeding from the skin below. This is known as a spit sign. That is when you scrape the plaque and you see pinpoint bleeding from the skin below. Now the histology is the stratum granulosum is thinned or absent. The stratum granulosum is thin or absent and extensive overlying perikeratotic scale, so nuclei still in the stratum corneum is seen. So that is psoriasis for you in a nutshell. So let's talk about uh, basal cell papilloma or seborrheic keratosis. This is a non-cancerous benign skin growth that originates in keratinocytes. non-cancerous and like liver spots are seen more often as people age they appear flat and greasy in various colors from light tan to black they're round and oval shaped they feel flat um, or slightly elevated like the scab from a healing wound and range in size from very small to more than 2.5 centimeters across they can be pigmented and contain squamous epithelial proliferation with keratin-filled cyst that is known as a horn cyst. Because only the top layer of the dermis are involved, seborrheic keratosis are often described as having a pasted-on appearance. And that is basal cell papilloma for you. So let's talk about infectious skin disorders. So we have impetigo. Cellulitis. Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. You also have hairy leukoplakia. All 
All right, so let's talk about each one of these. So impetigo, what do we know about impetigo? Well, it's a superficial bacterial skin infection most common among children two to six years of age. People who play close contact sports such as rugby, football, and wrestlers are also susceptible regardless of the age. It generally appears as a honey-colored scab. Um, formed from dried serum and is often found on the arms, legs, and face. It is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus and sometimes Streptococcus pyogenes. And that is impetigo for you. So let's talk about cellulitis. What do we know about cellulitis? Cellulitis is an infection of the deep subcutaneous tissue of the skin. It can be caused by normal skin flora or by exogenous bacteria and often occurs where there is where the skin has been previously broken. So cracks in the skin, cuts, blisters, burns, insect bites, surgical wounds, or sites of intravenous catheter insertion. Um, group A streptococcus and staphylococcus are the most common of these bacteria, which are part of your normal flora of the skin but cause no actual infection until the skin is broken. That takes us into staphylococcal scalded syndrome. This syndrome is induced by two epidermal, um, epidermolytic exotoxins, which is exfoliant A and B. Which are released by Staph aureus. and cause detachment within the epidermal layer. One of the exotoxins is produced by the bacterial chromosome while the other is produced by a plasmid. Bacterial plasmids are pieces of self-replicating DNA that often code for secondary characteristics such as antibiotic resistance and toxin production. Now these exotoxins are proteases that cleave desmoglein 1, which normally holds the granulosum and spinosum layers together. It presents with fever, generalized erythemous rash, and thin walled fluid filled blisters that easily rupture. Ryder syndrome or Ritter's disease
of the newborn is the most severe form of staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome with similar signs and symptoms. That's Ritter's disease of the newborn. And that takes us into hairy leukoplakia. What do we know about him? Hairy leukoplakia is a white patch on the side of the tongue. with a coriated or hairy appearance. It is seen in severe defects of immunity, particularly in HIV patients. The cause of this condition is an opportunistic infection by the EBV virus. The condition does not cause any other symptoms and does not require any treatment. If treatment is required, Acyclovir is the drug of choice that you use. That's hairy leukoplakia for you. So let's talk about melanoma. This is important in high yields for the boards. Melanoma is a malignant tumor of melanocytes, um, which are found predominantly in skin, but also in the bowel and in the eye. Melanoma is one of the rare types of skin cancer, but causes the majority of skin cancer-related deaths and is found in fair-skinned patients and those with abundant sun exposure. It is due to uncontrolled growth of pigment cells called melanocytes. The sole effective cure is surgical resection of the primary tumor before it achieves a Breslow thickness greater than one millimeter. For clinical indications of possible melanoma, keep in mind the ABCDF. That's asymmetrical skin lesions border of the lesion is irregular. The color, melanomas usually have multiple colors. The diameter, moles greater than six millimeters are more likely to be melanomas than smaller moles. Evolution, the evolution or i.e. change of a mole or lesion may be a hint that the lesion is becoming malignant. Also look for elevation wherein the mole is raised or elevated above the skin. And the F stands for fair skinned or red headed people are at an increased risk. Other groups of people at increased risk include persons with multiple atypic nevi or dysplastic nevi or persons born with a giant congenital melocytic nevi. Um, let's see here. Tumor markers associated with uh, melanoma is S100 and HMB45. which stands for human melano black 45. Those are tumor markers. Associated with melanoma. So let's talk about some miscellaneous disorders. This will be fun. We got three of them. Lichen planus, solar keratosis or actinic keratosis and acanthosis nigrans. So let's talk about these three. Lichen planus is an inflammatory disease with mucocutaneous lesions characterized by the five P's.
and that is well-defined puritic. Purple. Papules. Which are planar. And polygonal in shape. Um, light microscopy reveals hyperperikeratosis with thickening of the granular cell layer. You get a sawtooth appearance. Um, of the of the ret pegs at the dermal epidermal junction. You also get a dense lymphocytic infiltrate at the dermal epidermal junction. Although most commonly idiopathic, lichen planus may be associated with, and this is very high yield, hepatitis C. Remember that. Lichen planus with hepatitis C. And also it can be associated with certain medications. Example, gold, antimalarials, NSAIDs beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, thiazides, etc. So that's lichen planus for you. So what about actinic keratoses? Actinic keratoses is a pre-malignant condition, uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, with basal cell atypia. A thick, scaly, or crusty sandpaper texture patches on the skin. It's more common in fair-skinned people, especially those who are frequently exposed to the sun, as it is usually accompanied, accompanied by solar damage. Since some of these pre-cancers progress to squamous cell carcinoma, they definitely should be treated. An actinic keratosis site commonly ranges between 2 and 6 millimeters in size and can be dark or light, tan, pink, red, or a combination of all these, or have the same pigment, pigment as the surrounding skin, called a cutaneous form. Risk of carcinoma is proportional to the epithelial dysplasia. So that's atenic keratosis. So what about echinthosis migrans? This is a brown to black, poorly defined, velvety hyperpigmentation of the skin. usually presents in the posterior and lateral folds of the neck, the axilla, the groin, the umbilicus, and other areas. It occurs due to insulin spillover from excessive production due to obesity or insulin resistance. insulin spill over from excessive production due to obesity or insulin resistance into the skin which results in abnormal growth being observed. It's also associated with endocrinopathies such as Cushing's disease and diabetes.
Um, visceral malignancies, pituitary tumors, and pineal tumors are also associated with this. Histology shows hyperplasia of the stratum spinosum. Sorry, I was talking about achinthrosis nigrans, and I wrote that on necrotizing fasciitis. So everything right here is achinthrosis nigrans. It occurs due to insulin spillover. You see it in Cushing's and diabetes, and you get hyperplasia of the stratum spinosum. So let's erase this and talk about necrotizing fasciitis. So commonly known as flesh-eating disease or flesh-eating bacteria, it is a rare infection of the deep layers of skin and subcutaneous tissues easily spreading across the fascial plane within the subcutaneous tissues. So symptoms. Patients usually complain of intense pain that may seem in excess given the external appearance of the skin. With progression of the disease, the tissue becomes swollen often within hours. Crepitus of the tissues occurs due to production of CO2 and methane. So what is the pathophysiology here? It's commonly caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. Which is part of your normal floor of your skin or anaerobic bacteria. Bacteria cause the destruction of skin and muscle by releasing toxins, which are virulence factors, which include streptococcal pyogenic exotoxins. In some cases, strep pyogenes superantigens may be involved in necrotizing fasciitis. Superantigens are capable of activating T cells nonspecifically, which cause the overproduction of cytokines. So how do you treat necrotizing fasciitis? Well, patients are typically taken to surgery based on a high in index of suspicion, and it's determined by the patient's signs and symptoms. In necrotizing fasciitis, aggressive surgical debridement is always 100% of the time necessary. So what about pigmented skin disorders? What do we know about them? Pigmented skin disorders include albinism, vitiligo, and melasma. So let's talk about vitiligo. Oh, let's talk about all of them. It's albinism, albinism, vitiligo, and melasma. And this right here is a picture of vitiligo, Michael Jackson disease. So what is albinism? Albinism is a form of hypopigmentary congenital disorder characterized by a partial um, or total lack of melanin pigment in the eyes, skin, or, and hair, um, or more rarely the eyes alone. So what is vitiligo? It's a chronic disease that causes the loss of pigment resulting in irregular pale patches of skin. It occurs within when 
the melanocyte cells responsible for skin pigmentation die or are unable to function. So you get a decrease in the number of melanocytes. And what is melasma? That's a tan or dark facial skin discoloration. Although it can't affect anyone, melasma is particularly common in women, especially pregnant women and those who are taking oral or patch contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy medications. For diagnosis, it's diagnosed visually or with the assistance of a Woods lamp. Which is in 340 to 400 nanometers wavelength. Under the Woods lamp, excessive melanin in the epidermis can be distinguished from that of the dermis. So how do you treat melasma? The discoloration usually disappears spontaneously over a period of several months after giving birth or stopping the oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy. So squamous cell carcinoma, this is definitely high yield, so we need to know all about this. This is a malignant tumor of squamous epithelium. It may occur in different organs which include the skin, the mouth, the lips, the lungs, the esophagus, upper and middle thirds, the urinary bladder, which would be from schistomyces hematobium, can also occur in the prostate, the vagina, and the cervix. So what are the signs and symptoms? The lesion is often asymptomatic. The ulcer and reddish skin plaque that is overgrowing you see intermittent bleeding from the tumor, especially on the lip. Um, unlike basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma has a sub substantial risk of metastasis. That's important to know. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common cause of, can of cancer of the skin after basal cell carcinoma, but more common than melanoma. So I would remember that. The second most common cause of skin cancer. Now let's talk about keratoacanthomas. This is a low-grade malignancy of the skin that originates in the pilosebaceous glands. It's similar in clinical presentation and microscopic analysis to squamous cell carcinoma except that keratoacanthomas have a keratin or central keratin plug. That's high yield. Whereas squamous cell carcinomas do not. So let's talk about Bowen disease. This is sunlight-induced squamous cell carcinoma in situ with full thickness atypia. Atypia. 
Compared to actinic keratosis, sunlight-induced squamous cell carcinoma in situ with basal cell atypia only. And then that brings us to the margillans ulcer. This is all, all over step two, step three, and possibly even step one. Very important. This is a squamous cell carcinoma that arises from a non-healing ulcer. Uh, a non-healing ulcer, a burn wound. So you got to watch out with this with burn patients. Or osteomyelitis. That is a margillans ulcer for you. And that takes us to thermal injury and decubitus ulcers. So burns are classified by the depth of tissue damage. You can have, number one, superficial burns. Number two, partial thickness. Number three, full thickness burns. Now, superficial, previously known as first degree, this is confined to the epidermis. It's red, it's dry, it's painful, um, it sloughs off the next day. A partial thickness, previously known as a second degree burn, is confined to the dermis. It's red, it's wet, it's painful, and it blisters. Now, a full thickness, this is known as a third and fourth degree burn, extends to subcutaneous tissue, it's leathery, it's dry, it's insinate due to nerve damage. It may involve underlying structures like bone, tendon, and muscle. Now, the wound itself is often is often further damaged by local inflammatory responses. So you get the zone of coagulation. Number two, the zone of stasis. Number three, the zone of hyperemia. Now the zone of coagulation is a central zone of dead tissue from coagulative, coagulative necrosis. The zone of stasis is an intermediate area of vascular damage with recruitment of inflammatory cytokines. So they frequently pro progress to necrosis, but they may heal with proper treatment. And the zone of hyperemia is the outer zone of increased blood flow that generally heals. Now, the systemic effects that result from a burn are proportional to the amount of skin damaged. Burns affect affecting a large, often greater than 40% portion of the skin surface area, often produce the following. Increased levels of catecholamines, glucocorticoids, and glucagon, so you get a hypermetabolic state, so therefore you're going to have in increased nutritional needs. They, they're a burn victim. Uh, they have a weakened immune system, so they're at increased risk of infections, especially from Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus and can Candida species, opportunistic infections. Um, you get a systemic release of mediators of inflammation, such as histamine, prostaglandins, bradykinin, etc. And this helps wound and systemic edema. Um, you get inflammation and edema, so you have a decreased blood volume and cardiac output. So therefore, you increase the blood viscosity and systemic vascular resistance. So that causes a tachycardia. The decreased cardiac output leads to a decreased renal flow. So you get a pre-renal azotemia and a possible acute tubular necrosis. So renal failure can occur if not appropriately treated. 
You get atrophy of the gut mucosa and apoptosis of epithelial cells, decrease, and that leads to decreased absorbance of glucose, lipids, and increased permeability to normal repelled substances like uh, mannitol, infectious agents, etc. You also get a decreased absorbance of nutrients like glucose, and that is due to a loss of transporters because of atrophy and death of the mucosa. This atrophy leads to a decrease in the normal protective barriers of the gut. And on top of all this, you have a decreased plasma volume, so you get a sloughing of the gastric mucosa, and that can cause an acute peptic ulcer of the duodenum, also known as a Curling's ulcer. Much of the treatment of burn victims is aimed at, at reducing these systemic effects. The primary factors that cause the cubitus ulcers, or AKA pressure sores or bed sores, are pressure friction, shearing forces, and moisture. That is the cubitus. Ulcers. These are pressure sores and bed sores. Pressure causes ischemic damage, further damage due to increased capillary permeability and edema. Decubitus ulcers often begin to form at deeper levels and progress superficially. A small ulcer often indicates a large underlying damage and should be further assessed. The wound itself can, be, can become infected and may spread systemically. So osteomyelitis is a frequent complication, which makes sense. Um, prevention by frequent changing of positions and removing moisture is the primary method for controlling ulcers. Let me repeat that. Prevention by frequent changing of positions and removing moisture is the primary method for controlling these decubitus ulcers. And this is, you're going to see this in patients like in wheelchairs that have uh, broken necks, broken backs that are prone to a wheelchair all day or prolonged bed rest. So you need to change the position and remove the moisture there to get rid of these decubitus ulcers or pressure sores. And the wound is treated by debridement, antibiotics, and pain medication. And that is dermatology pathology for you in a nutshell.